So, my name is Tobias. Uh, I'm from the University of Toronto, and I've also recently started my own company called Dirty Work VR. And today, you've heard a lot from other speakers about post production. You've heard about, you've heard about all kinds of stitching things. And now, what I'm going to talk about is louder. Yeah, no, just close to the mic. Close to the mic. Close to the mic. Okay. Yeah. So. Today, specifically, I'm going to talk about 360 camera arrays and different designs we put into cameras. So, to do that, I'm going to start with my own personal journey and start with my first camera. So, this is my first camera. Well, this is not my first camera, actually. This is a camera that I built later on. Um, this is a using Xiaomi camera that took them all apart. I got the sensors out of the cameras. And this is a design that was originally built by Jim Waters, who is somewhere in the audience, I think. And he, he, he designed it using Mobius cameras. So, I saw the potential of what he was doing, and I wanted to do it with a camera that would do 60 FPS rather than 30 FPS. But in the end, this design ended up not working out because they were not Gen Lock cameras. So let's take a look at what I did next. So the first camera I ever built was using this. This is an iPhone case that has a little mirror, and then the mirror splits the image in the 360. It's very, very low quality, but after I tried this, I knew I was hooked. I, I, I took my thing apart, I put it on a Canon 70D, and I took my first 360 video the day after YouTube announced their 360 player, and that's what got me hooked. So ever since then, I've been building little cameras, and one of the first problems that I encountered was price and cost. And I was a student, and so I couldn't afford a six GoPro rig, so I took, I took a look at what was available. Um, one of the most interesting things that I found was that there's a company in China called Xiaomi, and Xiaomi makes this Yi camera. The Xiaomi Yi is very, very comparable in picture quality to the GoPro. It's got a Sony XMOR sensor. It's $62 as opposed to $500 for a Hero 3 or like $900 Canadian for a Hero 4. Um, and it's very, very comparable in picture quality. So what I did was I took that camera and I, I put them together in a little cube. This is just something that I 3D printed from, from Shapeways, I think and it, it, it works pretty, pretty well. It, it, the demo footage looks very similar to what a GoPro does, and it does it at a, at a tenth of the price uh, of what you would pay for a freaking 360 rig. So one of the things that really disappointed me with this rig, though, was that I had to go in and press every single button to turn them on, press every single button to start recording, and I didn't like that. So what I did was I wired every single shutter together, um, and I have that camera right over... Where is it? There it is. Right over here. Um, it's very, very simple. I just took the cameras apart, I wired all the power buttons together, and I wired all the shutters together. My original intention with doing this was I wanted to get Genlock and I wanted to get Sync, but that's just not possible. With this many cameras, I think if you use Opto Isolators, as someone has recommended to me, that would work, but I haven't explored that uh, fully yet. So let's take a look at what I did next. So next, I reverted back to GoPros, because GoPros do have their advantages, and I realized that doing a cube configuration like this one, like the Freedom 360, um, it's hard to control where the seams are. So what I did, I put three 220 degree fisheye lenses on three GoPros and just all facing outwards. So that way you can perfectly control where where the actors are within a triangle, within this triangle, within this triangle. You can tell them not to cross this seam, not to cross this seam, and you'll have a perfect stitch. Um, and there, there are a lot of other advantages to using this configuration. Specifically, this was built for live streaming. So these have HDMIs coming out and going down here. And uh, it does, I think ultra resolution is 3K on this one, depending on how many frames you're shooting. So next, um, there's another camera. So the point of my talk today is kind of to show you that there is no one perfect camera. There are different cameras I use for different situations, and depending on what you're shooting, you need you need a lot of tools. Cameras, 360 rigs are like lenses. There is no one lens that will do everything. So if you're shooting inside a car, for example, you need two back-to-back -back cameras that have very, very little parallax, um, and this is kind of what I use to shoot inside of a car. Uh, moving forward, another configuration that works really well is what Backbone is doing over at that booth. They took apart the GoPros, they extended the sensors out, and they put them back to back. That lets you that lets you get very, very, very uh, little parallax, and it's great for 2D. So that's what I did next. And this is another one that I worked on. This is a, a, a DJI Phantom 3, and I put a, a GoPro up top, GoPro in the bottom. Same 220 degree lenses, but the advantage of doing this is that because the cameras are so far apart and the parallax is so great, you can actually stitch out the drone altogether so there's no drone. So that's the output. Um, there are, of course, some problems with, with stability. There's some problems with sync because of Hero 4s, but it was a proof of concept. It just shows what's possible with drones and with these cameras. So let's take a look at what's next. So oh, one really important thing that you guys need to know, and this is a lesson that I learned the hard way, is if you want to put GoPros on Phantoms, you want to put uh, electromagnetic shielding over the unit. Otherwise, it'll interfere with the GPS and the unit will fly away. You don't want that to happen. Yeah.
Closer, okay, sure. So let's move on. So next, uh, well, this is currently our current rig that we're using right now. Uh, it was the middle block that mounts the cameras together. It was built by a company in Los Angeles called 360 Designs. That's run by my friend Alex, and he's been doing great pioneering work on the Black Magic rigs. He's been in on this since last year's NAB when they first announced the Black Magic rig. So I, I, I like this configuration a lot, but one of the problems that I found with it is that the cameras are too far apart. So I'll kind of show you what I did to fix that later on, but let's take a look at other cameras from other people. So this section of the talk is going to talk about uh, kind of more esoteric rigs and, and stitching methods that are currently being used. So this is from Hype VR. A lot of people look at this and think, oh, this is silly, this is never going to work. What is this? The, too much parallax. But see, what they've done is actually really smart. They're using this Velodyne LiDAR, which generates a point cloud of the entire room. And although the point cloud is a low frame rate, there are problems with that. Um, what you do is you generate the point cloud, and then you take the RGB pictures captured by all of these cameras, and you layer it on top of that point cloud. And that, theoretically, should give you a 3D image. I personally have not seen output from this camera, so I don't know. But I know that the Velodyne whole system is a very viable one. So next, we have 360 Designs uh, 10 camera rig. And this is some really crazy stuff. Uh, this is using, I'm guessing, very similar to what Google's doing with their jump stitcher. Um, this is a stitching method that, that seems to be working well. But again, I haven't seen any output from it, so I don't know. But this is another approach. So what, what they're doing is called semi-global matching. And what semi-global matching does is it takes one image here, one image there, and it's as if it's a 3D image, but they compare the two to generate a stereo disparity map and also a point cloud. And you take that point cloud and you stitch it in 360, and then you layer your RGB image on top of that. So there are two ways to generate that point cloud. A is with a LiDAR system, and B is with uh, semi-global matching. And these are terms that if you Google semi-global matching uh, panorama, there are many, many research papers describing exactly how this is being done. So this is kind of where I'm at right now. This is built like uh, two days ago, like before NAB, I, I went to Home Depot, I got some power tools and I kind of figured out a way to get the cameras closer together. This is not, not like my design or anything, there are like other people that have done rigs just like this, but I didn't exactly have access to a CNC machine. So now the next part of my talk is going to be talking about, um, well we're done with all this stuff now, so let's talk about live. So there are two reasons why you want to do live 360 video. The first reason is that you want you want to be able to show things live. So for example, you're at an NFL game, you want to put a camera down and have people wear the headset and be transported, have telepresence, feeling as if they're there. That's one reason. That's the super obvious reason you want, you want to feel live stuff. So the second reason is because you can't see what your camera is shooting when you're in, when you're directly moving. When you're shooting, moving, when you're doing anything, you want to be able to have live preview. And the solution that's out there today, right now, is called Video Stitch Bahana. It's, uh, it works great. You, you use a capture card, you plug in your cameras, and you're good to go. Um, and there, it's a little bit finicky, but it works. But the problem with Video Stitch is it's really expensive. Um, as some of you know, Video Stitch, you have to buy a yearly license. And so, one of the programs that I discovered um, in my research, and this is not a very commonly known program, it's called Touch Designer. So Touch Designer is a free program made by a Toronto company called Derivative. And what they do is they make uh, BJ software. BJ is kind of like DJing, but except of using music, it's using uh, uh, visuals. So if you've ever been to like, uh, I don't know, Coachella, or you've been to like an EDM, or like a concert, all those crazy visuals that are projected map onto the wall, that's all using Touch Design. Um, they're a huge, huge, huge company, um, very well known, but they're not 360. However, within Touch Designer, you have a 3D stitch component. And how you do this is, you take uh, your, your however many camera rigs you want to use, however many cameras you want to use in your rig, you take screenshots of each camera, you put that into PT GUI, and then you generate one stitch template. You take that stitch template, you plug it into this program, and I'll show you exactly what that kind of looks like if I zoom out a little bit. So these are our four camera feeds going in. You got camera one, oops, camera two, camera three, camera four, and this is live straight from this black magic rig right here. And the, the stitching template was made by uh, a girl named Vicky. She does not work in 360 anymore, but the stuff she made is incredible. And you take the PT GUI template, you put it right here, and then you drag all these as nodes. They're, it's a node-based system, very similar to Nuke. So you drag all these nodes down into here, and you have your perfectly stitched, well, not perfectly stitched, but well-stitched uh, 360 video. And how this program is doing it is it's parsing the, the UV heat maps from 
uh, PT GUI and then warping these. So that's the original image. It's taking that heat map and warping it and then stitching all this together. There are blending problems because right now the Touch Designer plugin does not parse as much data from PT GUI as we want it to, but that's something that um, a couple of people are working on and trying to figure out a solution to that. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a guy called Andrew Hazelin. He's got a blog and uh, he's working on a way to make this work. So hopefully we'll see something cool from him soon. So that's pretty much what I've got for my presentation. Um, this is kind of the new the new mount that I, that I ghetto made a couple nights ago and we're trying to see if this will get our notable senses down a little bit. So thank you very much Tobias.